Um, I do have some disclosures. I have got research support currently from BMS slash Pfizer. Um, I also have done honoraria and scientific advisory boards for a number of companies. Um, but as I say, I don't do this very often. And this, uh, the last time I gave a, a series of talks that was paid for by Pharma was probably about two years ago. Um, most of the time, I'm just trying to run the Department of Medicine, which, believe me, that's a struggle. <clears throat> anyway, so let's just talk about why this is an issue. So the incidence of, uh, of BTE is, is quite high. It's one per 1,000 people. But most interestingly, as you age, it becomes much more common. So if you're over 75 years of age, 1% of people per year will develop a VTE. And you can see from the slide the dramatic increase in incidence as patients age. Important things on this slide are that basically the mean age of patients is 70 years um, to get a venous thromboembolic event. But as our patient population ages, as the population ages in general, of course, we're going to see more and more VTE. So it's going to not, going, it's not getting less in incidence. And it's very common in the U.S. Um, the best, what has the best stats is about 650,000 to 700,000 per year are affected. So in Canada, that's about 65 to 70,000 people per year are affected by this disorder. And as most of you probably know, it is a leading cause of death. It's the third leading cause from a cardiovascular perspective after a stroke and heart attack. And it causes 10% of in-hospital deaths. And I always thought that figure was incorrect until we actually did a study ourselves, an eight-year uh, chart review, and confirmed that indeed about 10% of hospital deaths can be attributed um, to pulmonary embolism. So that's still a bit shocking, and it's a figure that hasn't changed that much over several decades. And I think that um, it, it speaks to a need for us to investigate further how to do better uh, uh, in this disease. The other thing that really disturbs me a lot is that 22% of all patients with a pulmonary embolism die before they're diagnosed or on the day of diagnosis. And no one really knows why that is. So is it because the patients don't present, they ignore their symptoms? Is it because the doctors don't think of it? Is it because it's so sudden there's nothing much you can do? Nobody knows, but it speaks to a major public health issue when a fifth of all cases die without being basically without the opportunity to have any treatment. And um, this is sort of um, underlined by the fact that we know or we suspect from studies in the 70s from the 70s that the mortality from PE is 30% in the first three months if you don't treat it, and, and perhaps higher depending on the underlying illness. And this can be dramatically altered by treatment. So in clinical trials, your risk of death is 0.3% versus that 30 um, for DVT and 1.3% for pulmonary embolism uh, once you're on treatment. In real life cohorts, because clinical trials tend to have a selection bias always of who's enrolled in clinical trials, it's 0.6% for DVT and about 3% for pulmonary embolism. So it really does have an effect on mortality if you treat patients appropriately. And most people now who are well walking around um, who get treated do not have, have excellent outcomes. Very, very much lower risk of death than these numbers, because these numbers include sick people in hospital who are treated. So first, as, um, as Lionel said, um, what I made my name on is the uh, Wells criteria for the diagnosis of DVT and pulmonary embolism. So I'm going to go just briefly for a few slides on how you diagnose deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. So first, deep vein thrombosis. Basically, for those of you who know about managing patients, patients with a DVT can get swelling in their leg, pain, edema, a bunch of different signs and symptoms, which really are not specific on their own for the diagnosis. But they do suggest the diagnosis. So when Physicians see these sorts of patients. They have to do their history, physical evaluation of the patient, and make a decision. Do they have the possibility of a DVT? And if the physician believes that they have a possibility of DVT at the end of their assessment, then they should go on for investigation. And what we recommend they do is they go on and get uh, first thing done. Now at this point is they undergo a clinical model, a clinical, use a clinical assessment tool, such as the one that we developed, which is on the left of this slide, and the one that Odega developed in the Netherlands. Um, the one that has by far the most experience is the, is the Wells model. And um, as you can see, there's um, been over 9,000 patients the last time I checked about a year and a half ago that have been enrolled in studies that use the Wells DVT model. Um, and and meta-analyses have shown that it's accurate and reproducible. So it does work if you apply it. And it basically, I didn't go through the details of it, but it incorporates signs, some signs, some symptoms, and risk factors um, into, the, into the tool. So everything you, have to, everything you should acquire when you examine and question your patient. So if you need diagnostic tools, the most common one is the ultrasound. And ultrasound is actually a very simple test because um, you can 
basically image and press on the vein of the, the deep vein of the leg quite easily. And so, as you can see, the, middle, the, first, the first box on the left shows you the, the normal visualization of an artery in a vein, the vein being the blue circle. If there's no clot, when you press the ultrasound probe down on the deep vein, the vein collapses, and that means there's no DVT. If it doesn't collapse, that means there's a DVT in most cases. The trick is that sometimes that clot could be chronic and not acute. And so you have to understand that although there's no gold standard way to be sure which is acute and which is chronic, there are some findings of chronic DVT that are important to know. And those are that clots that are, that are full of echoes on the ultrasound, or clots that are what we call non-occlusive, so they don't completely fill the vein, or clots that are discontinuous. You've got a little bit here, and then there's a gap with no clot, and another clot a little further along. That's not how DVT works. And also, if the DVT doesn't start in the, in the, in the calf veins or doesn't start in the iliac veins, it's not likely to be acute. Because that's what clots do. They tend to start about 90%, 95% start in the calf veins, and they just keep growing on top of each other. It doesn't grow a bit here and a bit there. It grows on top of each other. And what patients are always shocked to know, because most, most patients, when you tell them they have a blood clot, they think of something the size of your fingernail. But it's not. It's usually about this long. It fills your entire vein. So it's about this long and it's about this wide. So it's huge. And that's why you can die from it. Because if a chunk of that breaks off, it's going to go up to your lungs. If it's big enough, it blocks all venous return to your, to your lungs. If you have no blood return to your lungs, you're dead. You have to flow blood through your lungs and back to the left side of your heart and pump out to your brain and your heart, et cetera, right? So if you block the blood flow in, that's how you die from a pulmonary embolism. So they're not little things. They occupy a large, it's a, they're large volume. <coughs> Another diagnostic test we have is known as the D-dimer. So the D-dimer is what we call a fibrin degradation product. When clots form in your body, whether they're microscopic clots or big clots like in a DVT, the ends of the fibrinogen molecule stick together. And those ends are called the, the, the D epitopes. And they stick together because it, there's a D here and a D here, and they stick together. Um, and your body immediately starts trying to dissolve the clot. So anytime we hurt ourselves, or we're, we're in a process of, of forming the clot to stop the bleeding, but then you've got to stop the clot from progressing. So imagine if you have an injury and you start to, you start to bleed in that, in that tissue. If you didn't, you'll, you'll first you'll clot to stop the bleeding. But if you didn't stop the clotting, the clot would keep going. So all of our body systems are in balance. Just like, you know, when you eat, you release insulin and then there's glucagon as the, as, the, as the contrary hormone. So as all our systems are in balance. And when you form a DVT, you've lost that balance. You're forming clot more than you're dissolving it but you're still dissolving the clot. So almost everybody with a DVT has D-dharma released into their bloodstream. Unfortunately, it's released into your bloodstream with many other conditions as well, such as, like I mentioned, sort of trauma, hematoma, pneumonia, cancer generates D-dharma, all sorts of stuff generates D-dharma. So a positive is not all that helpful. A negative is, because if you don't have D-dharma present, that's going to be helpful to rule out DVT, and I'll talk about how you use that. The cutoff should be 500 if you're 50 years of age or less, and it should be your age times 10 if you're above 50 years of age. So that's not what's commonly being done right now, but that's the right way. There's now enough data to support we should do that. So if you're 85 years old, your cutoff's 850 for your D-dharma result for it to be negative, less than 850. If you're 50, it's 500 um, is a negative result. Okay, now what do you do subsequently? So as I said, you suspect DVT after you've done a history and physical. At that point, you do the Wells Clinical Probability Score. If the patient's likely probability, they proceed to ultrasound. At that point in time, if the ultrasound is abnormal, you would treat. If the ultrasound is normal, you can do a D-dimer. And if it's negative, you can stop. They don't have a clot. If the D-dimer is positive, you might want to consider repeating the test in a week because in Canada, we don't image the calf. So it might be a small calf clot that grows up into the proximal veins. Um, so you repeat the ultrasound in a week. Um, if you're unlikely clinical probability, then a D-dimer is negative, as you see on this slide, then you can rule out DVT and you don't need to do an ultrasound. And that's a big savings from the, for the healthcare perspective, because a lot of people would just do ultrasounds in all patients. And that's the other approach I have in this slide. It's called the whole leg ultrasound approach. This has been studied and shown to be safe and effective, but physicians are not really properly evaluating patients. They're not trying to make a determination if the patient is uh, a low probability or a high probability. It is important because if patients are high probability and the result is normal, it could be 
that you've, that you've missed the clot because no test, and I'm talking about ultrasound here, is always right. No test is 100%, 100% sensitive or specific. It's going to miss some clots. So when you're high probability, you have to suspect that maybe the ultrasonographer is making a mistake. And if you haven't done a clinical assessment, you won't think that way. Similarly, if it's abnormal, but the patient was really low probability, you have to consider, well, maybe that abnormal result is a false positive if the patient was low probability. And you go talk to the ultrasonographer, are you sure? Did it have any of those features I mentioned about being an old blood clot? Because um, you don't want to treat patients unnecessarily because there's risk. It's really the same story for diagnosing the blood clot that's gone to your lungs of pulmonary embolism. You do a clinical assessment. There's three tools that have been used here, and these have actually been studied much more extensively. Um, so the modified Geneva model and the Wells model, and this is a different model that I published for pulmonary embolism, um, have now been shown to be safe, accurate, and reproducible in many, many, many patients. Last I checked, over 55,000 patients in 52 trials show that if you apply these tools, they work. They will classify patients accurately as low, intermediate, or high probability, or unlikely, or likely, <clears throat> depending on the criteria you use. <clears throat> and similarly, as I said before for DVT, if you're PE unlikely, or low intermediate by the modified Geneva criteria, and the D-dimer is negative, then the patient doesn't need to be investigated for PE. They do not have a PE. If the D-dimer was positive or the clinical assessment is such that PE is likely, you need to go on to a diagnostic test. And the most common test used is CT pulmonary angiography. If it's positive, you have a clot. If it's negative, you don't. <clears throat> now, we don't always want to have to use CT because CT, for those of you who are familiar with CT, you know that it's, you have to give contrast and that can affect the kidneys. It's a fairly large dose of radiation. It's fairly expensive. It's not available everywhere. So there are limitations with CT. You can't use it if people have renal impairment. So if people have significant renal disease and you give them contrast, you can push them into renal failure. So you can't use CTPA in all patients. So <clears throat> in that case, you could use some other approaches. One of the possible approaches is you do an ultrasound first if they have symptoms of DVT. If they have symptoms of DVT in the context of being likely having pulmonary embolism, Ultrasound will be positive in up to 40% of cases, and then you avoid having to do the CT and the radiation and the contrast. The other approach is to do, uh, especially if the patient has a normal chest x-ray, you can do a VQ scan. So a VQ scan has less radiation. I don't know if any of you are familiar with VQ scans, but it gives a not very nice looking picture. A CTPA gives you a beautiful anatomical picture of all the vessels going through the lungs, and you can, even an amateur can usually quite easily see when there's a clot occupying one of those blood vessels. But in a VQ scan, it's a very fuzzy kind of picture, and there's criteria that you have to apply depending on the size of the, of, the, of the segment that's affected by perfusion. So most physicians aren't very good at reading VQ scans. They're not very comfortable with them. So it's kind of fallen out of favor. But it can be used without question safely and accurately in a diagnostic strategy as we proved um, in the 90s and early 2000s. <clears throat> if you have an abnormal chest x-ray, you should just go right to CT scan. <clears throat> so... That's really it for diagnosis. Now I'm going to talk about treatment of VTE. So we like to divide the, the treatment of DVT into phases. <coughs> Excuse me. We call the first phase the acute phase, which is the first five to ten days. And what you're doing here is you're preventing the extension of the clot. You're preventing embolization if you have a, that big massive tube of clot in the DV, as a DVT. You're reducing mortality from pulmonary embolism by reducing recurrent events. It's relieving symptoms. <coughs> There's also long-term therapy, <coughs> excuse me, and that's considered to be from day five or ten to three months or six months, and that's completing the treatment of the acute episode. And it's very important to tell patients in this situation, because the way we do it is we see people the first day of diagnosis, we see them a week later to make sure they understand what's going on, that their medication's going well, and then we say to them, we'll see you again in three to six months. So you've got to make sure you inform patients in that time frame that that they're not going to drop dead if they walk. Um, they, they're not a walking time bomb. Otherwise, many people will become so worried that they're about to drop dead from their clot that they actually don't function. They don't go back to work. They're worried constantly. So it's very important to educate patients properly about their illness. After three to six months is what we call the extended therapy phase, and I'll talk a little bit about that later and how we try and decide who goes into that phase. <clears throat> So we also divide DVT into categories of our VTE, 
in the categories of unprovoked or provoked. Um, unprovoked represent now 50% of all VTE. That's you and me and people just walking around. We're not sick. There's nothing wrong with us. And all of a sudden, boom, our legs swollen, painful, we have a DVT. Or boom, we've got a clot in our lungs, we have a pulmonary embolism. Unprovoked. Like, why would we get something? There's no obvious cause. <clears throat> there are, however, the other 50% are what we call are provoked. And they can be provoked by cancer, which now represents about 30% of our patient population by patients that have antiphospholipid antibodies or heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, um, or most commonly, um, about 20% of all cases, I should say, uh, due to reversible or transient risk factors. What are those post-surgery DVTPE um, and other factors that you, like being in hospital with um, medical illness or being bedridden or having a cast on your leg, long travel, leg trauma, that type of stuff. Those are all reversible or transient risk factors. It's important to note that that group of patients has a risk, once they come off anticoagulation, their risk of getting a new clot is very low. It's about 1% or less per year if you develop your clot after surgery, and it's about 4% per year for the other category. It's very high for provoked. It's about 25 to 50% of people in the next five years or so will get another clot if you stop anticoagulation after three to six months. So 25 to 50% versus 4 or 5% or less. Very different illnesses, right? <clears throat> and that has implications for treatment, as we'll talk about. In the acute phase, however, as I mentioned, that first 5 to 10 days, there's no difference in how you treat provoked or unprovoked VTE. And there's no choice, really. You've got to treat it. As, you, as I mentioned earlier on, there's a high risk of death without treatment. There are right now a lot of options. So there's sub-Q, low molecular weight heparin, IV, unfractionated heparin, monitored sub-Q, unfractionated heparin, unmonitored sub-Q, unfractionated heparin, fondaparinux sub-Q, or monotherapy now with rivaroxaban or apixaban. And I know apixaban's not available in uh, South Africa yet. In terms of choosing between the parenteral products, low molecular weight heparin is the choice. It allows outpatient treatment, and it's actually been shown in meta-analyses to be safer and more effective than unfractionated heparin. And, it's, and you, don't need blood, you don't need to do a blood test to monitor unfractionated heparin. So really, to me, there's no argument here. You use low molecular weight heparin if you're going to use a heparin. So now this brings us to how can we say that we can use monotherapy with rivaroxaban? So as most of you, I'm sure, are aware, the Einstein studies of DVT and PE give us this evidence that we can use this drug. So these, I'm going to show you in the next several slides uh, the combination of the Einstein data. So these studies were randomized, open-label, event-driven, non-inferiority studies. <clears throat> there has been some people who say the open-label um, fact makes it a less rigorous study, um, but I don't agree with that. Basically, the outcomes of recurrence and bleeding were adjudicated by independent parties, um, and, and these things aren't hard to decide in most cases. So what did we take in this study? We took patients with confirmed DVT without symptomatic PE. That was the Einstein DVT study. And we took patients with confirmed PE with or without DVT. These patients were randomized to rivaroxaban 15 milligrams twice a day for 21 days, then followed by 20 milligrams once a day for 3, 6, or 12 months. And the comparator arm is the standard, which was anoxaparin twice a day once uh, with concomitant vitamin K antagonists. And once the INR was over two, for two consecutive days, the inoxaparin was discontinued. That was considered standard therapy. You can see from this slide that a lot of folks went into these studies, 8,282 patients. And importantly, the very last two boxes there lost to follow-up. So very few patients are lost to follow-up, and this is essential in all randomized trials. If a lot of patients are lost to follow-up, you don't know what happened to them. They all might have died from pulmonary embolism. So it's generally accepted that you need less than 3% of your patients lost to follow-up. But basically, the fewer loss to follow-up, the better, right? So those of you who have been involved in trials will know that you've got to keep on people, you keep on the investigators to make sure that they don't lose patients. The other important finding, I think, worth noting on this slide is the withdrawal of consent. It was only 100 in the river oxman arm and 195 in the vitamin K antagonist arm. I think this is important because if there is some kind of nuisance side effect or issue with rivaroxaban, it might come up in withdrawal of consent. 
So there really wasn't a signal here that there was a major issue that people were not tolerating the river oxygen. And that's important, um, obviously, to ensure that we're be comfortable with compliance with taking the medication. <clears throat> now, if you want to look at the patient characteristics, about equal uh, men and women enrolled in these trials in each arm. Um, you can see the mean age of patients was 57, which is younger than what I told you before is the average age of a patient um, in clinical practice. This is typical of clinical trials. We tend to not enroll older people because there's a fear that they may not do as well on the new, on the new product or in the, under investigation. And I'll show you how that fear um, actually is not, was, not, um, was, not born to be, was not shown to be true in these studies. So you can also see from this slide that, the other, that not many patients, but a, but a reasonably significant number, had creatinine clearance impairment of 30 to 49. So there are 8% of all patients in the trial. So, you know, overall you'd think, well, that's not very many patients who were enrolled who had renal impairment, um, 8%. But remember, these trials are large. So there are 320 patients per arm who had, the, uh, um, who had impaired creatinine clearance. Most of the current standards of treatment that we've been using for the last decade or so were based on trials that had far fewer patients than that. So we used to treat patients in hospital for 14 days um, for DBT or PE. And this, there were studies done that showed that we only needed to treat patients for seven days. In those trials, the, 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 the seminal paper that showed that published in The Lancet enrolled 160 patients per arm. And yet we changed all of our practice based on a study that had a total of just over 300 patients. So the fact that you have 600 patients <clears throat> in this particular subgroup, we look at it and think that's not a lot of patients, but you know, a lot of practice that we've done before has been based on a lot fewer patients. You can also see from this slide that patients with unprovoked VTE represent about half of all patients, as I mentioned earlier. So it suggests that we didn't enter a biased population of patients from that perspective. This slide shows the primary efficacy outcome of recurrence. <clears throat> and you can see that rivaroxaban met the non-inferiority margin, has a ratio is 0.89. The absolute rates were 2.1% versus 2.3%. Time and therapeutic range is 61.7%. A lot of people worry about this time and therapeutic range. Is this appropriate? Is this low? Most studies, meta-analyses, again, have shown that in community practice, the time and th therapeutic range for warfarin at best is around 55%. So this would suggest that patients got at least or better than what normal practice is in communities. So if we look at those age, body weight, gender, and creatinine clearance subgroups, is there a signal that rivaroxaban uh, for the primary efficacy outcome may not work in a certain group. And you can see that basically all those, those um, diamonds are on the left side, so in favor of doing better with rivaroxaban. So there's no signal that there's a group we really need to be worried about. <clears throat> and this was the primary, the principal safety outcome, um, which was first major or clinically relevant non-major bleeding. And you can see again, the non-inferiority margin was met. <laughs> But perhaps more importantly, <clears throat> sorry, um, and no subgroup shows that there's any sort of signal that that primary principle of safety outcome may be an issue within one of these weight, age, gender, or creatinine clearance subgroups. <clears throat> the most important thing for me, though, is major bleeding. So major bleeding is how you die. And a lot of data suggests that your, your risk of dying from a major bleed is around 12%. So we want to avoid people having major bleeds. And you can see here in this situation that rivaroxaban actually was superior to the vitamin K antagonist arm for major bleeding with an event rate of 1% versus 1.7% and a hazard ratio of 0.54. So it looks to be a safer drug from the perspective of first major bleeding, which is the bleeding that we really care about. And again, if we look at subgroups, we'll see that all the, all the, all the diamonds are on the side of rivaroxaban. But importantly, the groups that we thought intuitively would maybe do worse are, are doing even better. So those who are older, over the age of 75, 1.2% versus 4.5%, <clears throat> and you can see where the hazard ratio falls and significantly different. <clears throat> and you can also see for those who have a creatinine clearance less than 50 where the hazard, where the hazard ratio falls, 0.9 versus 4.1% for vitamin K antagonists for major bleeding. So the groups that would be worried about major bleeding actually do much better than the group as a whole. And again, I think this is a very reassuring finding. In terms of key secondary and other outcomes, no difference in total mortality, strokes, acute coronary events, 
systemic embolism or liver toxicity. Liver toxicity was always a major fear <clears throat> because um, the first um, direct uh, uh, oral anticoagulant that came out to challenge warfarin was zymolagotran. And that drug, AstraZeneca, poured a billion dollars into clinical trials with zymolagotran. In the end, they decided there was liver toxicity and they had withdrew the product from the market after spending a billion dollars. So no one really knew, or knew why that was happening with zymolagotran, but obviously there's a fear with any new direct oral anticoagulant that, they may, that finding may crop up again. And thankfully it did not. <clears throat> In terms of subgroup analyses, <coughs> we pre-specified that we'd look at fragile patients, and I've already shown you really most of that data in the fragile patients. The fragile patients are those over 75 years of age, creatinine clearance less than 50, and weight less than 50 kilos. And if you pool them together and compare the results with rivaroxaban versus the vitamin K antagonist arm, you can see that for recurrence, there was 2.7 in the fragile group, 3.8 in the noxaparin group. So no concern there. And as you can guess from the slide I showed you before, for major bleeding, 1.3% versus 4.5%. So, um, and, and, it, and it is confirmed that with warfarin, those patients do worse, because you can see that the non-fragile groups of patients on that slide in the vitamin K antagonist arm um, do a lot better. So this is a very reassuring finding, because I think whenever you start these drugs, you're always worried about using it in this type of patient, the fragile patient. <clears throat> and what about cancer? Um, most patients were not being enrolled in these trials with cancer because the standard at the time was to use low molecular weight heparin uh, as monotherapy, but some patients were entered. And you can see from these slides that when we looked at those patients who really, again, turned out to be a seemingly insignificant number because it's 230 versus 198. But again, harking back to those old trials that we based our practices on, these are not that few of patient. Few, these numbers are not that small, really. Uh, it's just put in the context of 8,000 patients. And you can see that there was no signal that patients on rivaroxaban were going to do worse than patients with vitamin K antagonists. Um, in fact, in both cases, the data was is trending towards uh, favor of rivaroxaban. <clears throat> and these probably were real cancer patients because you can see that their recurrent event rates exceed those of non-cancer patients, and the major bleeding rate exceeds those of non-cancer patients. And we already know that cancer patients do worse than standard patients from the perspective of recurrent clots and from the perspective of bleeding. So some of these patients truly were higher risk patients and did fine on rivaroxaban. <clears throat> and as I mentioned earlier, there are those who worry about INR. How good was the therapy in the comparator arm? Does the degree of time and therapeutic range with the INR in the comparator arm make a difference? And it appears as though no from this slide. So people were getting good therapy, good treatment with uh, the vitamin K in the vitamin K antagonist arm. So we can conclude from all those slides that patients with acute symptomatic DVT and or PE rivaroxaban showed non-inferiority for the primary efficacy outcome. Similar incidence to uh, noxaparin and vitamin K antagonists for the primary safety outcome. Superiority for major bleeding. And consistent efficacy and safety results irrespective of age, body weight, gender, renal function, cancer, and data I didn't show severity of DVT and PE. So it looks like a single drug approach for the treatment of acute DVT and PE um, can be done. Now, I believe this to be true and not a fluke because there's also another studies, other studies that have been done with direct 10A inhibitors. You're probably aware of apixaban. As I said before, it's not registered in South Africa, but the studies have been done using similar designs. Um, so in, in these studies, however, the um, apixaban was given at 10 milligrams BID for seven days, then five milligrams BID. And it had a similar comparator arm, the enoxaparin and vitamin K antagonist arm, and a similar three, six, 12 months treatment um, time, time profiles. And you can see here in the, in the recurrent event rate and VT-related deaths that apixaban was a little better, not statistically better, but still in the right direction, right? It's the lower line in yellow. Time and therapeutic range was similar as we got in the Einstein trial, 60.9%. So this is what, this is reasonable uh, these are reasonable values. And most importantly for major bleeding, um, significantly better and fewer major bleeds with apixaban <coughs> with a relative risk of 0.31. So again, suggesting direct 10A inhibitors are safer. So can we use these for outpatient treatment? 
Obviously, I think it's very widely accepted. It's done a lot for DBT uh, around the world, less so I understand in South Africa. But we also do a lot about uh, patients with pulmonary embolism as outpatients in Canada. A lot of people think that we're, some, we're radicals and you know, we should all be burned at the stake for, uh, for treating PE as outpatients. But it works. We've been doing it since the mid-90s. We send about half of our patients home. We know they have good outcomes. We followed them. We follow all of our patients. It works. But it seems to be something that was uniquely Canadian. And again, I just wanted to share with you some unique Canadian things, since um, you may never get to Canada. And the first one is our friend the beaver. <clears throat> so pretty much looks as ferocious as your lions and tigers and leopards, and not tigers, but leopards and so forth. Um, that little. That little dude is quite ferocious, not to you, but it destroys trees at a prolific rate. It's unbelievable. Uh, I hate the beavers, but they, they make warm hats, so they're, they're good for that. <clears throat> uh, maple syrup, we're the world's largest producers of maple syrup. Literally millions of gallons of maple, maple syrup are made per year. We actually have a maple syrup cartel. Um, we have this massive storage depot in Quebec where they keep all the maple syrup and they can control how much is released. It's a lot like oil, but it tastes better. <coughs> Poutine is our, one of our major delicacies, especially in Quebec. So, and this can be made anywhere in the world, so you can start making this in South Africa. It's French fries, cheese curds, uh, which is a soft, uh, soft, mild cheese, and gravy on top. And it's sure to give you a coronary within a couple of months if you eat this on a regular basis. Um, we struggle with that in our, uh, in our Quebec population. Um, anyway, it is actually quite good, but you do have to limit how much of that you eat. And then the last thing is ice hockey. So most of you, I'm sure, have never seen anyone in, in person playing ice hockey. It's actually an incredible game. The Montreal Canadiens are sort of the iconic Canadian team. I hate them, though. Um, I live in Ottawa, so I'm an, uh, Ottawa has its own team. So I'm an Ottawa Senator fan. They stink, though. Um, <laughs> anyway, that's the way it is. So there's some uniquely Canadian things for you to take home from this talk. <clears throat> All right, now, what about... Can we do this outpatient treatment? Is it really that we are radicals in Canada? The answer is no. There actually are meta-analyses and there are studies that show that if you take patients who are considered low risk by certain prediction rules, you can safely treat them at home. There's a whole bunch of prediction rules out there. The Geneva rule, the PESI rule, the Ojeski CPR, the Muragapan CPR. They all show that if you apply these, the patients who have low scores have low in-hospital mortality, suggesting they should be good candidates for home therapy. So if you want to use those tools, that's fine. We use more common sense. So we just we, we obviously don't send people home who require oxygen, who are hypertensive, who are extremely tachycardic, who need IV narcotic relief. Uh, <clears throat> so we don't send unstable people home or people who might be unstable. But 50% of all PE patients fit into a very stable category. <clears throat> so in the acute phase of treatment, then, just to summarize, if people are stable, with DBT or, if you want, or good prognosis PE, if you apply those prediction tools, we can do outpatient therapy with the drugs that I've mentioned. Poor prognosis PE, we consider initial hospitalization, but as soon as they're stable, we send them home, again, with outpatient therapy. Unstable patients, if the PE is hemodynamically, resulted in, in, uh, in hemodynamic compromise or severe hypoxia that requires or close to needing intubation, that's when we give thrombolysis. And if patients are actively bleeding or have a contraindication to get immediate anticoagulation therapy, we put in uh, retrievable vena cava filters. Other treatment issues, you can ambulate patients early. Obviously, that's how we treat people at home. In fact, there have been randomized studies. There's been comparisons about ambulating patients and not. And ambulation is a good thing. So there's no reason not to do it. Graduated compression stockings, we now use them to treat symptoms of swelling and pain in the leg only. We used to think they might prevent post-thrombotic syndrome, but we just completed a, completed a study that we published in The Lancet, led by Susan Kahn, <coughs> of over 800 patients with a sham control group. So one group got fake stockings, and the other group got real stockings, and there was no difference in the development of PTS. And you'd say, I don't know if any of you have worn stockings before, but you might think, well, can, can people really know what, not know what a fake stocking is? And you, they didn't. Because I guess if you've never worn one, you don't tell, you don't tell the patients, this is a really tight stocking. It's really a bugger to get on. Um, he's telling me we're going to randomize to a stocking or not. And what happened is the stocking would get shipped to their home from the company, from Sigveris. And the patient said it looked like a, it was in a real stocking box and everything, and they put it on. They didn't know it was a fake stocking. So half got a fake stocking, half got a real stocking, and it didn't prevent po uh, post thrombotic syndrome. It's too bad. <clears throat> okay, so now whenever we're talking about extended 
Well, actually, whenever you're talking about anticoagulation in general, you have to weigh risk and benefit. There is no need to weigh risk and benefit for the most part in the, in the first three months. Everybody needs anticoagulation because there's a high risk of death. It only comes into really being something we consider when we're going to treat beyond three to six months. <clears throat> so that's why, as I mentioned earlier, the transient risk factor patients, it's really not an issue. They have a low risk of recurrence. Remember I said if it's after surgery, your risk of recurrence is around 0.5% per year. If it's after immobilization or medical illness, it's around 4% per year. So those people only need three months of treatment because the risk of continuing therapy is probably higher than the risk than the, the benefit of continuing treatment. And this is where I think rivaroxaban is particularly ideal because it's probably also cheaper. By the time you use seven to 10 days or five to 10 days of low mycoid heparin, which costs considerably more, by the time patients keep coming back every few days and then every uh, week for several weeks, um, they've had a lot of INR tests, which are not inexpensive. It's also very inconvenient for the patient. You usually barely have figured out what the dose is for the patient by the end of the three months. So <clears throat> it's very inconvenient and probably more expensive to use low mycoid heparin and vitamin K antagonists when you're only treating for three months. <clears throat> so that's certainly ideally suited for using rivaroxaban in that, in that particular area. For malignancy, I'm not going to talk a lot about malignancy because it's kind of a more um, complicated topic. In general, most people are still using low mycoid heparin for the first six months. And at the six months after that, it's a patient preference decision. I think there's evidence to support that we, should, we could use rivaroxaban in that phase. <clears throat> it's the unprovoked people who are the big problem. So as I mentioned before, their risk of recurrence in five years is somewhere between 26% and, um, and, and 50%. For the sake of argument, we'll call it 26%. <clears throat> so that's a fairly high risk of recurrence, right? 26% in five years if you stop anticoagulation therapy. So you should, so a basic principle we could say should be that you continue the anticoagulation unless the reduction in death from preventing a recurrent VTE does not clearly outweigh the increased risk of death from a major bleed by continuing treatment. Or a patient wants to stop. Patients have a choice. So the holy grail in thrombosis is determining that risk of recurrence in the individual patient and that risk of bleeding. So you can help inform them as to whether they continue anticoagulation therapy. So can we identify subgroups with different recurrence rates? The one group that's most fascinating to me is uh, looking at gender. So as I mentioned before, the overall incidence of a VTE appears to be similar between men and women but not recurrence. So an Austrian study showed, as you can see on this slide, that recurrent events occurred in 20% of men and 6% of women when anticoagulation was stopped. That's dramatically different. We showed in our reverse study, 19% of men and 9% of women developed recurrent VTE once we stopped after six months in unprovoked VTE patients, so double. <clears throat> so that's, not, that's, that's a very interesting finding just on its own. But a 9% recurrence risk is still pretty high. So we tr tried to develop a prediction rule um, for both men and women uh, using their data separately. We were unable to develop a prediction rule to identify a low risk of men, but we were able to identify a low risk of women using a model called the HERDU2 model, which I'll explain um, a few slides from now. <clears throat> so let's just go back to that risk benefit decision that we have, <clears throat> and let's look at men. So if the rate is 26% in five years for all, but the rate's at least double in men, it's, it, that 26% came from combining men and women. So if now if we take men out of that, they rep their risk of recurrence is about 39% in five years, right? Because the whole group is 26%, but men have a higher risk, and they re represented half of all those patients. So they're around 39%. <clears throat> so if you took them off anticoagulation after a first unprovoked proximal DVT, 1.5 men would die out of 100 in a five-year period. <clears throat> if we continue the mon if, if continue the mon anticoagulation therapy, 1.2 will die because the risk of bleeding is about 2% per year. So in other words, <clears throat> it's a bad idea to stop anticoagulation in men. And I have on this slide even higher risk categories. So the second unprovoked proximal DVT, first unprovoked PE, and second unprovoked PE. PE, all have an even higher risk than that 1.5 of dying if you stop anticoagulation. And of course, the bleeding remains similar in all those four groups. So it would appear from this that you can never stop anticoagulation in men. And that's pretty much what we do now. It's very unsatisfactory 
because you're a 40-year-old man, you don't want to have to continue anticoagulation, your life expectancy is otherwise probably about 80. It's kind of terrible to have to continue anticoagulation therapy, but that's the state of what we know right now. <clears throat> For women, though, again, if we take that 26% and we lump them all together and we realize that men are the majority of the rec recurrences, women's recurrence rate might only be around 13% in that five-year period. It's probably, it's probably higher than that, but it's definitely going to be lower. So, again, depending where you make that cut point, it may be that it's more dangerous for women to continue on anticoagulation um, in this case because you can see the 1.2% fatality rate exceeds <clears throat> those first three fatality rates from stopping anticoagulation. So it may be that women, we're overtreating women if we continue therapy. But it all depends on that actual rate, that 13% <clears throat> rate and knowing what exactly that rate is. So, as I'll show you soon, the HERDU2 rule, I think, allows us to make these separations uh, and do a better job in deciding which women should continue on anticoagulation therapy. But will we get any advantage from using rivaroxaban or the other um, direct oral anticoagulants in this patient population? <clears throat> Basically, from the bleeding perspective, there's been no real difference from the recurrence perspective, as I showed you. Those curves are almost superimposable. But from the bleeding perspective, major bleeding occurs 1.0% 1. 1. versus 1.7%. That's like almost half. Intracranial bleeding, 0.1 versus 0.3. Uh, fatal bleeding, less than 0.1 versus 0.2. So it looks like a safer drug. And in fact, this meta-analysis of all the studies in VTE using factor uh, direct 10A inhibitors shows you that fatal bleeding, that the, uh, that the re relative risk is about 0.32 for fatal bleeding. The relative risk for intracranial bleeding is significantly in favor of these drugs, and so overall is the major bleeding rate as I just showed on that previous slide. So these are safer drugs, so they are going to have less risk of bleeding, presumably on long-term therapy. We don't have a lot of patients who have continued on long-term therapy, so it's a hard to make these comparisons for certain, but this is what the data looks like from what's been published so far. So then all of your, your fatal bleeding rates are much lower. Does this help us decide which men would not need anticoagulation therapy, and definitely no, it doesn't, of course, because already in the previous slide I showed you that men would have to continue therapy. So cutting down on the bleeding doesn't help make the decision, but it certainly makes treatment safer. Does it make a difference for women? Well, it might, because now you're getting to the point where the risk of, of um, recurrence, uh, the, if you stop therapy, the fatal, the fatal risk is almost the same as the bleeding risk in that first and second group. So maybe all women could be continued on anticoagulant therapy, or at least um, <clears throat> three or, or two of these categories could be continued on anticoagulation therapy using a safer drug. Even using those figures I said are not necessarily right, the 13%. So I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it's, the, it's balancing that bleeding risk and that risk of the death from bleeding versus the, the risk of death from recurrence. So cutting down on your risk of bleeding death in women makes a bigger difference than it does in men at this point with using this data. <clears throat> However, maybe we can use what we found from the reverse study. So in the reverse study, we developed that HERDU2 rule I mentioned. The HER stands for hyperpigmentation, edema, or redness. Pretty easy things to determine on a patient's leg, okay? So those are signs of post-thrombotic syndrome. If you have those, that is a risk factor. It scores a point. If you have a D-dimer level over 250, that scores a point. If you're, if you're obese for the BMI over 30, that scores a point. If your age is over 65, it scores a point. So the HER is the HER, um, the D is the D-dimer, the two O's are obesity and old age. <clears throat> so HER do two. But if you only have zero or one of these factors, the annual recurrence risk was only 1.6%. So that's very low, and there'd be no point in continuing anticoagulation therapy in these patients. Any prediction rule should be prospectively validated, so we are prospectively validating it right now, and we finished the, I think we just actually entered the last patient, I got an email yesterday, <clears throat> so we've entered the last patient yesterday, we'll have a few more months of follow-up, and then we'll see if the rule worked. The first look is that it does work, and it applies to about 35 or 40 percent of women <clears throat> that, that, are, that they are low risk. So you could take all them out. The remaining women now, of course, have a higher risk. Because if your overall risk was, say, 8%, and you take out half of them with only 1%, the other group is obviously going to have higher risk. So it's around 14% in our original data derivation. So now, that 14% per year is the same as men. So it's looking like if you apply the HERDU2 rule, 
um, and you're not low risk, we can lump women in with men now. <clears throat> so hopefully what this is going to be true, but this is what we're doing now. We apply the HERDU2 rule. If it's negative, low recurrence risk, we stop anticoagulation. Um, basically, all others should continue on anticoagulant therapy unless they're high risk for major bleeding. But we aren't really sure how to determine who's high risk for major bleeding. So we're just basically continuing most of those women now also on anticoagulant therapy, generally using <clears throat> the um, direct 10A inhibitors because uh, there's a lower bleeding risk. And for men, <clears throat> basically all men will get indefinite um, anticoagulation therapy is what we're doing. The only potential, potential group is that lowest risk group, which is one unprovoked DBT. If you could identify which patients are at high risk for bleeding, you could not anticoagulate those men. But like I said, we don't really know how to identify who's at high risk for major bleeding. <clears throat> I have used serial D-dimers in some men. So if your, if your D-dimer test after you stop anticoagulation remains normal for three months, the recurrence risk is lower. It's still about 6%, which is still not insignificant. Um, so, but many men who are young are choosing to follow that route rather than going on lifelong anticoagulation. And so this, this speaks to the need to consider the patient's preference. And it should always be a strong consideration, including whether the patient can afford the drug, right? That's obviously something you have to establish. <clears throat> we don't have any real easy ways to establish patient preference and, make, and do decision making with patients, but we need to work harder on that. <clears throat> We're all very busy, so we don't sit down to make, sh make sure that patients really adequately understand the risks and benefits. But that's really what we should be doing in medicine for everything, not just, not just DBT. Because there's always trade-offs for everything, right? Nothing comes without some cost. Either, either um, quality of life, um, other side effects, or, or cost. <clears throat> so we do have some challenges left, I think you can tell, after what I've talked about. We need to develop a tool that identifies that men at low risk of recurrence. We, didn't, we were unable to do it so far. A tool that identifies people at high risk of bleeding would be very useful and more studies on cost effectiveness. Lastly, there's been a lot of talk about the risk of, of bleeding with these drugs, the fact that there's no antidote. People panic about that. As I've already shown you though, there's about half the risk of bleeding and less than half the risk of fatal bleeding on these drugs. And that data is derived from the very first trials in humans with these drugs, when we had no idea what to expect or what to do. So if we did so well then, why is an antidote such an important thing? And there's no proof, there's no randomized trial that reversing warfarin makes any difference. Maybe it doesn't make a difference. We all do it, and I'm not suggesting people not reverse warfarin if people are on it and they bleed, but it may make no difference. We're never really going to be able to prove that because no one's ever going to say, let's take patients who have major bleeding and not reverse them because you can reverse them. But really, it may make no difference. <clears throat> and the other interesting thing is that there was a, the registry study um, published out of um, Dresden in Germany that um, showed of 66 patients who had major bleeding, only six got to the point where they wanted to have and gave blood products as an antidote. Now it is a registry study, and registry studies have limitations, of course, but that's intriguing. So if you follow good practice, which is sort of basically here, identify and stop all anticoagulants, <clears throat> identify the source of bleeding, apply local and surgical measures to gain source control, and provide supportive measures like packed red blood cells or saline, like volume replacement, most people will be controlled and not have an issue and will not need to get anything more than that. The other things you can do is confirm the timing. Um, you could give activated charcoal if it's within four hours. Measure your, your coagulation parameters. Maybe the, maybe the patient hasn't even been taking the drug. Um, measure creatinine clearance, so if they have been taking it, you know when it's likely to be out of their system. Um, you could consider the use of tranexamic acid, one gram IV every eight hours, but there's no real proof that makes any difference, and that probably should be reversed, re reserved for patients who have, uh, who have been on antiplatelet agents as well. There should be few of those. If after all that, bleeding continues <clears throat> or is life-threatening, then you can give FIBA, which is activated prothrombin complex concentrate. I might, that might not be available here in South Africa, then you can give prothrombin complex concentrate. And there's studies in volunteers that show prothrombin complex concentrate will correct the coagulation abnormality in patients who are on rivaroxaban. It's interesting that the, the people who are the, the, against the use of these new drugs will say, those are in volunteers, and all you've done is you've corrected the coagulation parameters. That means nothing. 
because you need to have a clinical outcomes to prove that, that, that correcting that with prothrombin complex works. Well, we don't have any of that data for warfarin, but everyone's comfortable using warfarin and reversing it. No one's ever proven that warfarin also has any effect on clinical outcomes. It only affects, you're, all you're doing is you're getting your INR back to normal. So you can use the same argument, why are you using plasma and why are you using prothrombin complex concentrate and why are you using vitamin K in patients on warfarin? There's no proof it affects clinical outcomes. So, you know, you can't talk out both sides of your mouth. So I think the antidote thing is really overhyped, personally. This is a slide, again, just emphasizing the, the, the lower rates of bleeding. <clears throat> and also supported by combining all the VTE trials with the atrial fib trials, same thing. If you look at the bottom, that diamond at the very bottom of the chart, with a, relative, with a risk ratio of 0.53 is, is for major bleeding, combining all the studies that have looked at target-specific oral anticoagulants compared to vitamin K antagonists. Half the risk of major bleeding. <clears throat> so the drugs are safer. In these trials, the drugs are safer. Um, how should you discontinue rivaroxaban before surgery? If the bleeding risk for the surgery is low, stop one day before. If the bleeding risk for the surgery is considered to be high, stop two days before. No need to bridge. For dabigatran, which is unavailable here for atrial fibrillation, if you're low risk uh, for surgery and your creatinine clearance is normal, stop one day before. If your creatinine clearance is somewhat impaired, stop two days before. High risk for bleeding, normal creatinine clearance, stop two days before. Some people prefer three days before because this drug does have a longer half-life. If your creatinine clearance is impaired, stop three or four days before the surgery. And again, you don't need to bridge because the drug is gradually getting out of your system, so <clears throat> there's no need for bridging. And we know from the uh, rocket trial that a, a large number of patients had to come off of river oxygen, over 7,000 patients, and they weren't dropping dead from strokes when they came off their drugs for a short period of time. So this sort of stopping the drug for a short period of time is clearly safe. And again, remember, these, these, these were in the context of these studies. This is when people had no experience with these drugs and when to stop them. So very first in human trials showed very high safety profile. If people use common sense, they should be even safer in real life. <clears throat> for urgent surgeries, if it's within 24 to 48 hours and the surgery is needed, you're likely safe to just take them to the surgery. Because as I mentioned, we're generally stopping only one or two days ahead anyway. If it's urgent and they have to go to the OR, what we do is we use FIBA on call to the operating room. <clears throat> and post-op management, we generally restart the first day with a um, prophylactic dose, 10 milligrams of rivaroxaban. If it's a low or standard bleeding risk patient population, we start there back on their 20 milligram dose the next day. High bleeding risk population, we go for prof dose for three days, then start back on the 20 milligram. <clears throat> and all these protocols are being evaluated in studies right now to prove that they're safe. But logically, they're going to, be, they're going to work. Logic doesn't always work. It doesn't always show to be true. But um, I suspect that this is going to be, this is going to be the way we, we manage these patients. Lastly, inferior vena cava filters. If anticoagulant therapy is not possible, we recommend the placement of a retrievable IBC filter. Um, and you should subsequently receive a conventional course of anticoagulant therapy if the risk for bleeding resolves. <clears throat> and filters in a large um, hospital database study have been shown to reduce mortality in patients with hemodynamically unstable PE <coughs> and in patients who get thrombolytic therapy. This hasn't quite become the standard of practice yet because it's, a, it's, a um, it's database driven and not clinical trial driven. And lastly, if you were in Canada right now, this is why I left, I'm skiing on the, or skating on the canal. You gotta be crazy to do this, as I tell everybody here, because the wind howls down from the, the north. The north is the top of that picture, and it just howls down. Minus 40 the other day with the wind chill factor, when, um, and the canal, if the sun was out, it would be full of these crazy people skiing up and down the canal in that in nutty weather. <clears throat> Not me. <laughs> but um, it is an interesting thing to do if you ever come to Canada. I'll try and hook you up with the right equipment because you're going to need it. <laughs> anyway, thanks for listening. That's, um, I think enough's been said. <laughs>